Oh, Sal. Oh, oh Sal. Oh, good. A bunch of Cherokees in here. Uh, my theme today is going to be Leo, and we have a Leo sitting in our audience here. <clears throat> um, but I want to start off first uh, celebrating Claudius' brand new poetry book, Mangoes Without Border. Beautiful cover, uh, designed by Tim Britton. So, and then I'm going to read Claudia a poem from this book previously published. Stunned into awakening. And this will start off my theme. Titled, An Uproar, Woman's March Around the World, January 21, 2017, by Claudia Popla. Stirred by old rituals deep in our generic codes, women rise up today. In different places around the globe, like bamboo of the same stalk that flower at the same time. Millions meet in the streets, voices shouting, keep your laws off my body, and signs dancing, rise up woman, no mud, no lotus. Our drums, the loud slap of a beaver's, beaver's tail, thunder overhead, waves smashing the shore, an ape pounding her chest, women pounding the streets, carrying kettle, bongo, tom-tom, tambourine, and their children. Making her story under the same banner, women's rights are human rights. Rising during a cold, frightful time after a tea party on the White House lawn reveals the unmasked faces of fascists. Rising like seeded soil to the sun, our drum beats sound as one, our voices resounding, the she lions roar. Now, that starts my theme, but before I get farther to get us in the mood of ancient Greece, ancient Mediterranean, the focus you know, over here on this little piece. <clears throat> This wonderful little piece that somebody has painted in a kind of watercolor, I guess, on a pottery plate. That is the Parthenon. And, and a couple nights ago on KBBS, they had a wonderful about 15-minute piece on the Parthenon. Very surprising and coinciding. And what it was about <clears throat> is that very recently, it's been in progress, process, uh, a walkway, a cement walkway has been made up to this. Now, where this is located, it's, they call it the Acropolis. It's a, a large rock butte, a very sheer on one side that overlooks the city. And up there, there were these um, temples, we would call them, that were made. And the main temple there is called the Parthenon. And this was the Temple of Athena. Now, Athena is the protectress of the city of Athens there. <clears throat> and this was built in 440 BC, and it was designed by Phidias, famous sculptor, who also, also made the sculpture that was housed inside this temple, like colossal um, a sort of statue of Athena, made of gold and ivory. It was really, really tremendous. And uh, so that was, you know, 450, 440, 450 BC, like that. So that's what it was. <clears throat> uh, later, the Persians had attacked Athens and they somehow destroyed or stole the statue. And other things, you know, had happened after the advent of Christianism. Uh, it was made into a church. 
and then the Arabs came and then they made it into a mosque. And then the Venetians and the Turks got into a fight with each other and the Turks put all their armament in the temple and the Venetians, you know, lobbed a cannonball and it you know, blew up the inside of the temple. So you see a lot has gone on. Well, making this walkway up up there so people could uh, be in wheelchairs and, and all, you know, ways of getting up there. Well, there were purists, you know, who definitely thought that that was, um, you know, somehow polluting the environment. I mean, it's just, you know, full of rocks and debris of all kinds. I mean, it, it's all very interesting. But uh, putting a walkway in, you know, wasn't any worse than what had been happened. But to see the piece was really touching uh, on film because you hear people uh, uh, from everywhere. People come there by the thousands. Uh, people in wheelchairs and, and uh, other things to help them walk, you know. We're so uh, grateful, so grateful for it because they uh, felt the energy, they felt the spiritual energy, is what they said, of being able to be there. So I really wanted to start out with that so that we're now located in ancient Greece. Now we're, we're moving from the House of Cancer into the House of Leo at this time. So I want to start out with Cancer. These two houses are very important uh, in ancient Greece. And a little bit, you know, uh, to say beforehand, uh, long, long ago the Greeks had, they must have had, you know, fantastic teachers a you know, long, long time ago who knew the latitudes and figured out the latitudes and the alignments is what they called them. And so they made, you know, monuments, they made shrines, they made temples, you know, designating these places. Really, really fantastic like that. Um, and that had its own kind of evolution. Later, eventually, the zodiac, astrology, came in from, you know, the Near East, you know, Phoenicia, Chaldea, uh, like that. And the, the Greeks took that in as well and kind of mixed it together with their sites like that and then develop myth along with them. So many, many of the, of the myth are actually things that are changing in the zodiacal houses. You know, Perseus and beheading Medea, the Gorgon, is actually a change of the Gorgons into the virgins for the house of Virgo. That's one. So all of those kind of things. So I want to start out, you know, with Cancer. Now, Cancer uh, is the house of the moon. So you can go up here. That would be Selene as uh, the moon. And while it's the house of the moon, the moon also moves through all the houses. And then here, down below this, this is the donkey that's in the constellation of Cancer. Yeah. Cancer is a constellation that at some point to somebody resembled a crab, so the crab is the, the usual standard for the um, sign or symbol of Cancer. But in the constellation there are two donkeys, kind of east and west donkeys, and usually only one is portrayed. So that stands for the donkey in the constellation for Cancer. Then next we have here, this is a scallop seashell. This is another symbol for the house of Cancer here. And then we come here down to this picture I have here. This is Apollo. And so I'll spend a little bit of time on Apollo. Apollo isn't really Greek. You could say he's even pre-Greek. I would say he is the coyote of the Mediterranean. So like the moon, he can be in any house. He moves all over. And um, he has various renditions of his name besides Apollo, which also is not a Greek name. I like Apollo Luna, Apollo Luna, Apollo Luna, Apollo Luna, uh, like that. So this is a picture of a life-size statue of Apollo. And 
everything that is relating to him. Here I have this as a figure of a crane. This means a crane. And so the crane was one of the times that Apollo metamorphosed into a crane into Egypt. So he went into Egypt like that. And the crane becomes very, very, very significant in all of these stories and everything. Uh, it's viewed that Hermes, along with inventing the harp or the lyre, you know, also derived the invention of the alphabetical letters from the flights of the crane. And uh, also Perseus, when he was commissioned by Athena to behead Medusa, gave him a bag to put her head in, and that bag was a crane skin bag, meaning that what it really was for were the letters, the consonantal letters of the alphabet. So that's the other thing, is the alphabet and the zodiac and the latitudes all figure together in all of this fantastic ancient uh, history of the Mediterranean. So, so and then to my, my theme here, as you would say, this is a lion goddess. Now lion is the, the, the ultimate solar symbol. The sun, you know, Leo, and all that. And most of the figurations are actually the lion as a woman, or a woman as a lion. And so that's what this, this figure is here. This is actually second. But I want to go up here to my drawing. This is my drawing of Sereni. Sereni. Now who is Sereni? She starts out as a nymph. What's a nymph? The nymph is a maiden, either she's a, a spirit or she's a mortal who has interactions with spirits or, or immortals. In this case, um, what she was is that she was a young woman who liked to wrestle with lions. She was a woman lion wrestler. And she really liked to put the lion down for the count. And Apollo, he of course is some kind of immortal, like Coyote, uh, he saw her wrestling the lion and put the lion down for the count. So he fell in love with her. And falling in love with her, of course, then they got together and they made it. <clears throat> and here, this is a figure of her. She definitely figures out as this, you know, a very attractive nymph. We could really call her like that. And they had a son, and that's, this is his son, Aristius. Aristius is her son. And he's almost a saint. So now he's the son of Apollo and um, Serene. <clears throat> there was a plague, like you know, we have right now, like a, a pandemic, like that. At the same time that uh, we're at this, the solstice, the summer solstice coming up, is also the rising of the star Sirius. And so this was a very important event in that part of the world. And so that had a lot to do with. Um, Aristius here, he made some kind of offerings to the star, Sirius, and somehow that caused, you know, the god to send the winds that, you know, clear, cleared away the, the, the pandemic, uh, somehow. <clears throat> and then, as a reward to that, uh, the goddess of bees, uh, Care, um, she gave him, you know, the uh, wherewithal to become, you know, a beekeeper. So, here, and up here, this is the bee. And the bee is the um, a solar insect, a solar insect that's figured as the soul of Leo. So the bee is the soul of Leo, and here I have it here. And this image here I've replicated from a coin, an ancient coin, uh, that's in Sardis, that's in Asia Minor. And this would be the star of Sirius here in it. So that's who all that I have figured in all of this. So other incidents, you know, that figure in with the lion here, this figure here, uh, this, there are so many strange um, gods and goddesses and so forth, they seem to have made one for 
young women that would be kind of normal. Her name is Kitesh, Kitesh, and she is um, like like saying like being she's a goddess of love and beauty. And I'm sure you know young women must have uh, really adored her. And I have her here because she's always seen with a lion. So you know, making these relationships with lions and women with lions, you know. In the case of Sereni, because that she had been wrestling lions, she evidently evolved into looking like a woman who has the head and face of a lion. So that's who she is here. And this is, again, this is Seket, so I can go on to that. Uh, no, I'll go to this one here. This picture here, we're doing lion. Uh, this is called the Lion of Julius. So, Julius. The Latin name becomes July, becomes July, and <clears throat> this figure is very, very ancient. So it's on this little island uh, nowadays called Kea, Kea, and um, it's 20 feet long, like that. It's figured as a colossal, and it's figured that the date of this would have to be 2,500 B.C. because it's evidently believed to made to coincide of when the summer solstice was in July, and now it's June. So they've always had to uh, accommodate the progression of the equinoxes that were always changing. So now it's just that, and it has been known a very, very long time ago. And I want to refer to this, the Johann Goethe, the German poet and author uh, like that. So I think this is significant. He, uh, besides his you know, famous dramatic poem of Faust, that plays were made from that, um, he also made studies of geology and mineralogy. And this is a quote from him. The Lion of Julius is the only prehistoric trace of a vanished civilization that was great geographically and remains so. Maybe it was Atlantis. Good job. So I find that very, very significant. So it's figured to, uh, what do you say, orientated to the solstice of uh, winter solstice and summer solstice. <clears throat> the head, the, the body has, you know, kind of eroded, but the head is still. Uh, very, very strong in that. <coughs> then, next we're going to go over here to, to this. This is a petroglyph in Nevada, at Pyramid Lake. It's painted on a huge um, rock Tufa formation that I've done a painting of it uh, as the Sphinx of Pyramid Lake. This is all Egyptian. And this engraving, this is actually a painting, I should say, uh, is the Egyptian cat goddess, Bast. Bast comes from the word fire. Bast is fire. <clears throat> and this is Het uh, meaning House of the Moon. And this here has been neatly carved into the rock so the white would show out the way that I made it like that. And here is a, an Egyptian figure of, of Bast. Now Bast also goes together, they both blend with Seket. So Seket is basically the woman with the lion's head, and Bast is the woman with the cat's head. But they both kind of go together. Sometimes their name is Seket Bast. <clears throat> uh, making a kind of difference, Seket means Lady of the Flame. Bast mean, means the fire. So to see how all of this is working out. Again, this is in Nevada, Pyramid Lake in Nevada. And on this particular place, there are other painting similar to this that is painted that plainly is Egyptian. Now to 
shed some light on this, we go to India. Now, the culture in India, the ancient culture in India and the ancient culture of the Mediterranean, either it was that they were all taking place at the same time, or ACDC, one supplied the other. But in India, it has continued, for the most part, what has disappeared from the Mediterranean with the advent of Christianity and Islam, mostly, mostly. Uh, but this piece I, I want to illuminate this here. This is from the Shiva Sutras from the 9th century. Uh, it's a bija ah videnam. This is the quote. One should give full attention to the act of light of mind, the source of the world. Bijam means the source of the universe, the chief Shukti. She, the lion Shukti, is the source of all the gods and of the Shuktis in many ways. This source is of the nature of fire and moon. From it proceeds everything. Fire and moon, Agni, Sama, Atmika. So the Sakti is the cosmic energy or dynamic energy that's conceived as a female principle or she's just this generative power. So whoever made this, who knows how long ago, maybe thousands of years ago, on the Tufa there at Pyramid Lake, all the ideas, everything connected with these there in Nevada have all disappeared. Only I know what it is. And now I've showed you, you know, what has continued in India uh, and so forth because the Shiva Sutras is still vital, it's still act actively going. And you know, down here also I, I want to put this here because the, the cat and the lion are synonymous and here this would go along with the stone lion and then one more thing would be this little vase. This is an alabaster vase from about 2,400 years ago. And what we have painted on it are two lions and a swan or a goose here. Now, most things that came from Egypt were always in pairs or doubles, interesting. And one of those that lasted a little while were the two lions. So. In the zodiac, Leo now is opposite Aquarius. If you can go over here, this is Aquarius. This is figured by the winged horse, Pegasus. And not because it's aquatic, but because of the wings, it's air. It's a sign of air. But uh, earlier, instead of Pegasus, it was the lioness. So you had the lion, Leo, and the lioness opposing that way. So these kind of doubles, you know, figure a lot in it. And in this one, so we would figure these are the two solstices, and this one, which usually is Sagittarius, then must stand for the constellation that's circumpolar. Well, that's going around the top, so that's what's figured in the middle. So that's the way that we can see the ramifications of Leo coming out of Cancer. And again, Apollo has sanctuaries both in Cancer and sanctuaries in Leo. He is the uh, Greeks, that is the Hellenic Greeks, they absorbed him, they, they took him in the way Native America has taken in Coyote, like that. <clears throat> And yet he still has a relevance of, of independence at times. For instance, when the Mycenaean Greeks attacked Troy, Apollo was not on their side, <laughs> for, for, for instance. So anyway, he's a bit very in, interesting person, and uh, I've talked about him, I can talk about him a lot. <clears throat> and with that, I can go on now to a poem that I usually wonderfully I'm able to uh, find in Mary Oliver a poem to help to help me out here 
and this one she titles Varnasi, that's in India. Early in the morning we crossed the Ghat, where fires were still smoldering, and gazed with our mess western minds into the Ganges. A woman was standing in the river up to her waist. She was lifting handfuls of water and spilling it over her body, slowly and many times, as if until there came some moment of inner satisfaction between her own life and the rivers. Then she dipped a vessel she had brought with her and carried it filled with water back across the gut. No doubt to refresh some shrine near where she lives. For this is the holy city of Shiva, maker of the world. And this, her river, is his Shakti. I can't say much more except that it all happened in silence and peaceful simplicity and something that felt like the bliss of a certainty and a life lived in accordance with that certainty. I must remember this, I thought, as we fly back to America. Pray, Shiva, I remember this.